platforms that you are able to do that. I'm glad you're here to join us for this very critical topic. Um, full disclaimer. So I am, um, we are on the road returning from LA uh, yesterday in uh, what they call South Central LA, the All African People's Revolutionary Party. Organizers there held a Pan-African Women's Day. Um, hopefully you know we had a international webcast a week or so ago that was dynamic, but we still have local events. And so yesterday in Los Angeles, one took place and um, we drove down to support our sisters who carried that event. And I'm on our way back and had met with family this morning and so didn't have time to get back to Sacramento. So sitting out here right now in the middle of anywhere Ku Klux Klan bill, literally y'all, um, neo-Nazi town out here in the middle of nowhere. And, and as we start, you know, giving thanks to the indigenous people of the Western hemisphere and respect to them for their struggle for justice and their desire to live as complete human beings, um, just looking at this land and understanding that it, it's stolen from them and understanding that this is one of the places where, you know, our people, sundowner laws, we were lynched without question, I, I know that without even knowing, not even being able to tell you where we are, but without even knowing the particular history, I can, I'd be willing to bet you that that's true. So, you know, actually honored to talk about our struggle from this position in this place and glad that you all are here um, for this very important topic of colonized people's right to not trust this government on vaccines and everything else. So told you where I am, so apologize for any background noises, um, no way to mitigate that. We'll do the best that we can. And I'm again, glad that you all are here to join us today and we will get started as we always do, just with some quick intros. Um, longtime organizer for the All African People's Revolutionary Party, the organization that sponsors these sessions. Um, all over the world. And of course, with me as always is Shakura, my daughter, who grew up in the All African People's Revolutionary Party's Young Pioneer Institute program and is now, as an adult, an organizer in the APRP, just as I am, as well as a PhD student on the verge of finishing up. Um, this will be the first time that's really happened in our family, so very proud of her and everything that she does and honored to share this space with her, as well as share our relationship. So glad to be here with her. Um, going back to the AAPRP, our objective as always is Pan-Africanism, which we define as one unified socialist Africa, one unified socialist Africa. We believe that until Africa is free, united and socialist, that no African anywhere on earth, whether they know they're African or not is irrelevant. What language they speak is irrelevant. What foods they eat is irrelevant. Whatever, they none of us will be free until Africa is free. Uh, and we just do the work that we do. You see on the right, in Kwame Nkrumah's Handbook of Revolutionary Warfare is our blueprint for achieving Pan-Africanism. And in that book, Nkrumah, the founder of the All African People's Revolutionary Party, calls for the unification of all Pan-African formations who agree with that objective of one unified socialist Africa to unite into one political formation. And so that's our work and that's what we're doing. Um, yesterday we had in the program that I participated in in LA, we had representatives from the Pan-Africanist Congress, one of our sister parties that you see the logo there, PAC on the screen participating um, and in the International Pan-African Women's Day webcast, we had that as well as Eritrean Women Organization, the Amilcar Cabral Ideological School from Nigeria that's there on the screen, the African Party for Independence Beginning the South, which is there on the screen, and, and many others. So that's the work that we're doing. And obviously, we, uh, we have chapters all over the world and relationships with non-African liberation movements that are fighting against the same enemies we're fighting against, the international capitalist imperialist network. And so to get us started on today's topic, why 
colonized people don't trust the vaccines and everything else, I will turn it over as always to get us started with a wonderful foundation to Shakur. Thank you. Thank you, Daddy. Greetings to everyone. Um, as always, we hope that you are safe and well. We don't take for granted that you are here with us. And we also don't take for granted that your mind, body, and spirit hopefully are aligned in a healthy, safe way for you. So hoping that you are in good spirits and hanging in there and doing well with all the chaos and nonsense that is going on in the world. I'm really excited to talk today about this topic because I have a lot of passion for it. And so um, I just want to, you know, kind of give you forewarning that um, I'm really grateful to be involved with an organization that aligns in the same way that I align with how I feel about this subject, because it is a very touchy subject, for lack of a better term. And so I encourage you all to have an open mind as you listen today, because we definitely want to set the record straight and let you know why we are giving this topic today for our ancestors' voices. So let's make a couple of important points crystal clear. This is not a forum of views expressed by anti-vaxxers. We are not anti-vaccination. This is not a forum to advocate people to take vaccines of any kind. This is a forum designed to make it clear why African people and other oppressed colonized communities have every right to be skeptical about anything the US government says they should do, especially when it comes to injections and vaccines. Some people completely intimidated by capitalist propaganda are already going to be saying this broadcast is irresponsible, but we completely disagree. What we believe to be irresponsible is the denial of legitimate concerns by legitimate people about a process and strategy being carried out by a criminal government that has lied to us about everything for 500 plus years. They lie so much to us and about us that right now they are actively resisting and opposing our children even having comprehensive education about their lies in schools. Only a fool trusts the information from the same source that has lied to them consistently. If you have a partner, for example, who has cheated on you, once you establish that, you are never going to just accept what that person says, hook, line, and sinker, no matter what the situation is. This is true because although people think colonized people are stupid, we are not. We are not listening to idiots on the right or the left. We are acting based upon centuries of experience, living with lies, being normalized and passed as reality. And anyone who doesn't understand and accept that reality will never understand why we will not just accept what these people say at face value. Kwame Ture said it best. He said the system lies about everything. Even when the system is telling the truth, it is to cover up the lie previously told before the truth was told. Next slide, please. From the mass infection of smallpox against the indigenous people from European settlers, bringing it over in blankets, to mass sterilizations of African and indigenous women identifying, without their knowledge, by the way, unethical and anesthesized experiments against African women identifying who were slaves on the plantation fields, to the exploitation of DNA and biological cells, such as Henrietta Lacks and other nameless victims, and approval to the Tuskegee experiment where 400 Africans were injected with syphilis and or permitted to exist with the disease without being advised and or treated. And it continues on. 
Let's talk about Agent Orange being dropped on U.S. troops in Vietnam. Let's talk about how new mothers discovered they had rocket fuel found in their breast milk in Iraq and Afghanistan after the U.S. war efforts were there. Only a person with their head in the sand would trust anything this government has to say about health. I challenge you, my comrade and my family, I challenge you. If you trust this government and cannot comprehend why the party would take the position we have taken, we ask you to consider how trusting a vicious government has assisted us as a people in the past. Give us examples where poor people were not exploited, were not raped, were not abused, were not victimized, and were not killed at the hands of the government helping non-rich people. Because that's the clincher. We must look and assess the situation as a people, not as individuals. Malcolm said, when the white man asks you to shed some blood, you gladly go over to fight in their wars and shed all the blood. But when we, the people, make an ask of you to join our collective fight against oppression and or exploitation, or in taking a stand and understanding why we have a right to be skeptical about vaccines, you have no more blood to shed. You're not available to take the stand with us. You're not available to understand why we would have the positionality we have. So I encourage you and the party encourages you, do your research and your schoolwork with other people and discuss what you find. Uncover the lies and find the info for yourself and for your organizers that you organize with. Increased collective political education is the best weapon we can use against the master because that narrows down the gap of knowledge we have been erased and has been erased from us when we were colonized. You all stay safe. Asante Sana. Thank you, Shakur. Thank you, as always, for the wonderful foundation. And I just want to say that um, because I'm out here in the middle of Ku Klux Klan territory, I'm using, we're broadcasting through my phone's hotspot. So as a result of that, I don't want to mess with it to add Facebook or YouTube on there. So today we apologize, won't be able to look at any comments. Um, Shakur is smarter than I am, so she doesn't do social media, so she doesn't have access to those platforms. So we won't be able to look at any comments people make. You'll be able to look at them, those of you on Facebook and YouTube, but we won't be able to comment on them. So we apologize for that. And we'll be back to that next week. But I wanna talk now about the logical logic of colonized people, the things that we do that make sense. And the whole point I think of what Shakura just laid out for us is that the narrative is that the decisions we make, like if we don't, they, they keep talking about, well, our people don't trust the vaccines, like we're illogical and unreasonable people. And I think Shakura gave out, outstanding examples just now that illustrate that you'd have to be out of your mind to trust anything these people do. And this is not, it's not a question of, yes, we wanna see COVID go away. Of course we do, because everything like that that happens, our people are the ones who are disproportionately impacted. We're the ones who are dying. I'm talking about African people, indigenous people. So of course, only an absolute idiot would think that we're saying we don't wanna, we don't care about COVID. That's not the point. The point is that we want to, validate and respect the positions of our people because we have every right to believe what we believe. We have a history behind us. And the reason why I think that's uh, kind of confusing for folks is that people don't understand the difference between collective consciousness and individual consciousness. People, there's a capitalist society, money's more important than people, and everything in this society is about individualism. It's all about what I see in my head, what I think, and nothing else really matters. So because that's the dominant way people function in this backward society, people don't really have an understanding of the difference between collective and individual consciousness. And there's a fundamental difference. The difference is, our people are collective people. That's a part of our African culture. I don't care where you're born. You, I challenge you to 
go where African people are in any of the 120 countries around the world where we exist in significant numbers. On any of the three continents in the Caribbean where we exist in significant numbers. I challenge you to go anywhere you pick where there are African people and I guarantee you, you'll see a, a people who are collective. It doesn't matter where we're born. Drop this colonial analysis that we're different because of where we're born. That has nothing to do with who we are as a people. We have spent the last 500 years fighting to regain our dignity as African people. It doesn't matter whether people know that or not. It doesn't change the reality that it's true. So we are the same people everywhere we are on earth. And we that means we are a collective humanist and egalitarian people. And you cannot find African people anywhere on earth who do not practice those principles. So because we are a collective people, we engage consciousness on a collective level. And so Kwame was very fond of saying, for example, that yeah, our youth today, using them as, as just to make the point, they don't know anything about Martin Luther King or Malcolm X or the Black Panther Party or the Convention People's Party or the Democratic Party of Guinea or Yasantawa or Carlotta, they don't know anything about that. A lot of us know nothing about that, our people, but you can't make our people get in the back of the bus anymore. You can't have our people come in a restaurant and tell them they have to go through the back door. You'll have a full scale rebellion on your hands if you try that. That is an example, you all, of our collective consciousness, how we've evolved on a collective level. We don't have the individual knowledge and we need to get that and we can correct that. We're not concerned about that. But on a collective level, our people have evolved on a conscious level. We are conscious. When I was a young man, you couldn't tell me that I was the same as Africans born in other countries. In fact, I didn't even know that there were Africans born in other countries. I thought all the Africans in the world were here. I didn't know anything about Africa, nothing. It was the Tarzan continent. And today there's still a lot of confusion, but for the most part, most of that confusion has been effectively dealt with in the sense that even if people lie, I would argue the overwhelming majority of our people, even if they don't want to admit it, know that we're African people, know we have some connection to Africa. Even if they lie about it, deep down they know it's, it's really difficult to refute that at this point in history. So there's, those are just examples of collective consciousness and understanding that we have that collective consciousness. So because we have that, then when things happen, we evaluate them based on our collective experience as a people. So it doesn't matter, any Negro can get up and talk about, well, I don't have any problems with the police and our people are not gonna buy that. Indigenous people who also have a collective culture are not gonna buy that because we know that we have to evaluate it based on our collective experience as a people. Whether we're in California or Nigeria or India, it doesn't matter. We're still gonna deal with the police based on our collective experience as a people. Now, people with the linear European culture are never gonna understand that because to them, individualism is everything. So everything is based on their individual experiences. That's why it's so difficult for a lot of them to understand anything because whatever doesn't happen in their individual life doesn't exist for them. So it, it, it doesn't, you could have all the facts and analysis you want. It's never gonna register with these people because the only way they can analyze the world is through their individual experience. So it's very important to understand that difference, collective consciousness versus individual consciousness. Because our people know, based on some of the examples Shakur gave, and there are many more at home in Africa and around the world that we could give that talk about how King Leopold came into the Congo and thoroughly poisoned the people. We're seeing it now in Haiti, Haiti, where they're, they talked about it yesterday at the program, where they're coming into the country and killing people wholesale. If they don't out and out shoot and kill our people in Haiti, they're, they're uh, engaging in chemical warfare against our, this is always how these people have dealt with us. So our people know this, even if they can't cite the story and the source, they know this is happening to us. So because they know this, of course, they're not going to trust these backward racist governments and what they say about us. And anybody that doesn't understand now, you just, you're just a fool. You don't even understand what's happening all around you on the planet Earth. This is not a problem with our people. It's a problem with you being an idiot. So we're here to say that our people have a right to feel that way. And we have to do the necessary work to make sure whatever choices we decide to make, they're informed choices that benefit us, our families, our people, and the 
community at large. And we know that we are the guinea pigs for healthcare in this society. And we have learned to have this wait and see approach to that. You just talk to African people, you hear it everywhere. Well, I'm gonna wait and see what happens on that. Because we, we don't never wanna be the first people to try something like that because we know that historically they have used us to determine whether something works or not. And if it doesn't work, oh, well, that's just our problem. You know, we just left to our own devices to suffer and deal with it. So that's why we want to wait and see, you know, what happens. And again, that there's a lot of logic to that. And we have always been left to our own creativity to protect ourselves. We have no protection from this government on anything, anywhere. You can't name one area where if our people have an issue, we can depend on the government to fix it for us. Name one area where that's true. There isn't, there never has been and there never will be. So as a result of that, our people learn that we have to protect ourselves. And in an instance like this, we're talking about these vaccines. The way we do that is the wait and see approach. The way we do that is to question everything. That doesn't mean that we're trying to be difficult or that we're somehow, we don't trust science. We, we are the people that gave the science to the earth. So who the hell are you to say we don't trust science? We're the ones that gave you chemistry. That's the original name of Egypt, Kemet. That's where chemistry comes from. We created science. We created the understanding of science, I should say. We're the ones who contributed that to every people on earth here. And they have convinced our babies now that we can't study science. But that's not true. And we're gonna correct that too and get our people back to our rightful place of understanding that we are the scientific people. There's no question about that. So it's not an issue of, uh, well, we don't, you know, we just don't wanna do anything. It's the issue of we're trying to, it's like you walk out into an unsafe environment, you know it's unsafe, you proceed tentatively. That's what we're doing. And it makes every logical sense for us to do that. And then there's always the conflict between our traditional methods of healing and Western capitalist medicines. You see that all the time in our community. Even among African people that reject Africa or don't really understand their connection to Africa, they still, you see this all the time. Do you think that this focus today that African people have on health, herbal health, you think that we just, that just came on because we saw it on TV? That's who we are as an African people. That's who we are. That's where we come from. That's a part of our culture in Africa. We are just now learning how to reclaim that. That's all. So we have always had that. And so there's always going to be that conflict. With, and, and it makes sense because on the one hand, you have our traditional methods of healing, which have worked very well for us over the thousands of years that we practiced it. The only problem is that we lost it for a period of time, but as we're gaining it back and we're using our traditional methods of herbal healing to address these, pain, uh, these chronic conditions that are afflicting us because of capitalism, the use of Monsanto to grow foods that are not healthy for us, diabetes, hypertension, high, all of that stuff, heart disease, our natural healing approaches are effectively addressing those issues in many cases. So you have that on the one hand, and then on the other hand, you have the Western capitalist medicine system that kills us at will. And you act like you don't understand why people want to think about something else instead of that last thing. Well, you guys be out of your mind. So there is nothing, we say this all the time, there is nothing wrong with our people. Nothing wrong with our, the only thing wrong with our people is this backward system. That's it. Now, some people get confused because again, we don't know how to think critically most of the time. So when you say that, people are like, no, I have all kinds of things wrong with us. We killing each other. Blah, blah, blah. Well, yeah, but all every problem you we have, we can trace it for you back to our oppression as a people. Like you can't look at what happened in Rwanda in 1994 with the Hutus and the Tutsis in isolation. I know most of us, our only research and analysis of that was Don Cheeto in the movie Hotel Rwanda. I mean, if it wasn't for Hollywood, we would know nothing about ourselves. And actually because of Hollywood, we know less than nothing about ourselves. But the truth is that 
the Hutus and the Tutsis coexisted for thousands of years without any serious antagonism. It wasn't until the colonial forces from Europe came into Rwanda that now all of a sudden we can't get along, we have to kill each other. So you cannot analyze us killing each other without analyzing the conditions that oppress us. Our people have lived together. The same people who produced Bloods and Crips in LA that produced Vice Lords and Peacestone Nation in Chicago are the descendants of the people who lived together in peace and harmony in Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia. So why all of a sudden we got to kill each other? It's because of the economic conditions that we live in. Y'all watching TV, you watch their shows that tell, they tell you in broad daylight, like this show on Hulu, Snowfall, they're showing you that your central intelligence agency brought cocaine into South Central LA where we were just at this morning and allowed it to be sold so that that money produced from that could be used to fund the illegal Contra army in Nicaragua in the 80s. That's why that happened. So you cannot analyze us selling drugs and killing each other without understanding the role of the oppressor. And the problem most of you have is you don't analyze the role of the oppressor. That's why your analysis about what's happening with our people is absolutely worthless. Because boy, we, all we do is kill each other, sell each other drugs. Like we've never lived any time on earth without selling each other drugs. I mean, that's, come on now, like grow up and, and start, understanding that game is being played against us and it's our responsibility to figure out that game and change it so that we can solve these problems that's all so if we have a sober analysis and these are people you know primarily from oppressed communities that have uh suffered from covid right that you see on your screen and so if we have a sober analysis we know that the capitalist system by its own nature it can never be a system of trust and respect for people. Any system where money is more important than people, there's never going to be any trust. There's never going to be any value. And you all know, everybody listening to this and everybody that's not listening that you know, if you ask them, they know that this pandemic issue has never been about public health as a priority. It's always been about making money. Every, that's why they have to keep opening up and closing down because they don't have the concerns for public health to stay closed down long enough to get this thing under control because they are worried about making money because that's all this system cares about. Other countries have been able to get a handle on this virus because they just shut down. They paid people to not go out. So people don't have to worry about working. They paid people to stay at the house. And so they've been able to solve this problem. Whereas this country, that would never happen because they don't want to pay you anything. They want to make money off of your labor and exploit it to the best of their ability. So this is the reason why this system will never elevate trust and public safety above profit. It'll never do that. And our people know that because we've experienced that for 500 years. And again, when I say our people, I'm talking about all colonized people know this because they've experienced that. You know, you, you can't go to any indigenous community, any reservation anywhere around here and, and see people sitting around the table talking about whatever the U.S. government says, that's good enough for me. Nobody is that dumb in, that, in those communities to do that because they know for the history. You can't go to any inner cities where African people are or uh, other indigenous people or what they call Latinos. You can't go any inner cities and go around the table where these folks are. Well, I, I'm, you know, whatever the U.S. government says, that's the way I'm going. You, you, sure, you'll find one or two random fools that that say that, but that's only about some money when they say they, they see an opportunity to make some money. That's all that is. But you will never see anybody, by and large, articulating that as a viable logic and a way forward because we know better. So that's what we're saying is that this system, we're not fooled by it, and because we're not fooled by it, that's why people take a very slow wait and see perspective on how to proceed because people know that a government that places public health over profits or would earn people's trust a government that does that would earn people's trust if people had seen 
that, well, this government takes care of me, then you would have a totally different response to these vaccines. But the same companies that are making these vaccines are the same companies that make chemical weapons. So what kind of, I mean, I don't even understand how there can be any confusion about why people have concerns. You know, there's never been an issue of trusting, uh, there's never been an issue of placing people first. So people react to that as they rightfully should. And the only efforts to protect people in this country have resulted from mass struggle. In other words, and you can't name a single instance where this government has done anything to advance humanity that it has not been forced by demand to do so. Your Civil Rights Act that gives you so-called rights to work where you want, where you're qualified to work, to live where you have the ability to pay, to go to school where you're qualified to go to school. None of that would have happened here without people getting their heads bashed in in order for that to happen. If the people had not stood up to get their heads bashed in, you would not be able to work where you work today. We need to understand that. You would not be able to live where you live today. You would not be able to go to school where you go to school today. That is the only reason. So if you want to thank somebody and you, well, I thank the U.S. government for, I mean, you're out of your mind. You thank our people who sacrificed for that. That's the only people I thank. I don't thank this, this I owe nothing to the U.S. government, nothing zero to the U.S. government. I'm not an American. I owe nothing to them. I don't care if this plantation burns down to its knees. I just want to protect the masses of people who are here. But after that, the people who want to stand with America and stand up with America, if it's burning and you're burning, then you better have your own water because you will get no help from us. You will get the same level of help from us that you have given us. Zero. Zero, zero. So our people are not insane. We know that that has never been a, a thing here. And, and the, all the progress that we have made, we have fought, bled, and died to make that progress. So because we know that, we, we nobody really trusts that this government is going to do the right thing just on its own volition. Nobody trusts that. Nobody believes that. So we have... That's a smart way to approach things. You know, if you had somebody gaming you all the time, you saw them, you gamed them, and then you continue to trust them, I mean, that, you know, that at, at that point, that speaks to you, how messed up you are. So without this type of analysis, what we're left with is the, you know, this primitive thing of every person for themselves. And that's what's dominant here. And because that's dominant, a lot of people think that's the way things are supposed to be. People think that every person for themselves is the natural order of things. But that's because we don't know who we are as African people. That is not who we are culturally. That's not how we do things. And the minute we understand that we're collective people is the minute we begin to change things for the better. Clearly this individualistic approach to everything is not working for us, you all. It never has and it never will. So oh, some sensible solutions that we have to look at to understand how to, you know, effectively move past the situation. Because we don't like that it's our people getting sick. We don't like if our people dying. We don't want to see that happen. So here's some ideas as to how we can do that. I mean, I think we have to acknowledge first that there's no help coming for us from the system. Whatever help we have, we have to create that for ourselves. We have to acknowledge that because some of us still believe on some level in the system, or at least I'll say that we don't, we don't really know, we don't really know of any other options that we have. We don't know that we have any other options. So we think that that's it. And so we rely on that. I'll give you an example is for most of us, when we have trouble, all we know how to do is call the police. Even though we know the police are not our friends, they're not there to solve our problems. We do that because we don't have any other solution. And that is a, 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 a terrible place to be, you all. That is a jacked up position to be in. Yet for the majority of us, that's a position. Many of you listen. Some, somebody starts to break in your house, you have no plan except to dial 911. And they come there and they end up shooting you and and letting the burglar go free. 
but you have no plan other than that. And so that's what we have to correct. We have to create solutions for ourselves. And anybody that doesn't believe we can do that or doesn't believe it'll happen, then what you're saying is that you have totally accepted the premises of white supremacy, that we are not capable of creating what we need for ourselves as a people. So we don't need to listen to you once we establish that because you're speaking through the lenses of the enemy. But those of you who do have faith in ourselves and our people, then we have to figure out how we can do that. Well, the key is tied up into the fact that there are plenty of African scientists. There are African scientists in Europe. There are African scientists in Africa. There are African scientists in Canada, in the United Snakes of America, in Australia. There are African scientists in India. There are African scientists all over the world. The problem is that there's no collective consciousness that we are the same people and we have to fight for our interests. So all those African scientists that I named in all those places in the world, they're working for Pfizer and Moderna and Johnson and Johnson and Dow Chemical and all of these criminal organizations. They're not doing anything to advance the interests of the masses of our people. So that's what has to be corrected. We have to get people to understand that and we should be able to do it because the only reason why they are scientists is because, again, our people struggle, got beat down and murdered so that they could have the opportunity to go to school and achieve that objective. I don't care how smart you are. You weren't going to school in none of those places. In Africa, those places were controlled by the colonists, by the Europeans. They weren't letting you go to school to become scientists unless whatever you learned, that was to uh, prop up their system and keep them in control. They weren't uh, like giving you the information so that you could help liberate our people. None of these universities in this country give us information so that we can liberate our, that's so you can work for Moderna and Pfizer and them and advance capitalism. That's the only reason. But what we have to understand and what we have to go to our people and tell our folks so that they can understand is that that education you have that made you a scientist doesn't belong to you individually because you didn't pay the price to get it. The people that paid the price did that because they knew as a people we had to have the knowledge. People got their heads bashed in because they didn't want to see any more forced sterilizations of our people in Africa and in the Americas. They didn't want to see any more Tuskegee experiments. So that's why they were willing to die, you all, so that we could get that knowledge and that information. And we take that knowledge and information and buy a big house on the hill and forget about the people. I hope somebody breaks in your house tonight and steals everything. I hope they steal your drawers off of you, if that's what you did. I hope that's what happens, because that's what you deserve. They should take your underwear, tie you up, and set the house on fire, because you aren't worth the wood that's in your kitchen. You aren't even worth that. Because that job, that skill doesn't belong to you. It belongs to the masses of our people. And as we grow stronger in this movement, we'll build capacity to come and collect, to come and collect on that because it doesn't belong to any of us individually. It belongs to all of us. And once we get that, then we can create our own solutions. Don't tell me we can't. Socialist Cuba with an international economic blockade against them with the inability that means the inability to buy and receive pharmaceuticals, to receive any of the uh, uh, medicinals, pharmaceuticals to make drugs, they have come up with an effective COVID-19 vaccine. So you can't tell me that we can't do it. The only people that believe that people don't know anything. They have done that, it's been done, so we can do it. So that's what we have to figure out how to do as a part of this Pan-African work that we're doing. And then we have to have our own mechanisms for change and understanding the importance of change. Like we, 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 don't, we don't connect the dots. We don't know how to connect the dots. We don't know how to, to determine that the reason why these things happen is because of this system and what this system is set up to do and how its ability to do it is based on keeping us underneath it. That's how the system functions. We, we have got to come to the collective realization of that and stop thinking that, well, you know, the fact that 
so many of us die from how they make us guinea pig. That's just one separate issue over here on the left. And then police terrorism against them, that's one separate issue in the center. And poverty and, and lack of health care, that's another issue on the right. And mass incarceration, like we, all of that is emanating from the same process, you all. It's all the same source, this capitalist system. And until we organize and get rid of the system, we're always going to have these problems. I, I, I mean, it's hilarious to me when people talk about mass incarceration and they're not talking about capitalism. It's hilarious to me when people talk about um, how we don't have adequate health care, we're guinea pigs, and you're not talking about capitalism. You're talking about the police, and you're not talking about capitalism like you can reform the police without addressing the system that produced police in the first place, without acknowledging that police came out of slave patrols that were designed to intimidate us back to the plantation to continue picking cotton. That's where your police came from. And it, it, it's amusing that you think that we can somehow change that without acknowledging that history. I mean, that's a, a really politically immature person who would believe that and not recognize that this system was never built to, for us on any level. It will never be built for us. We cannot solve it by just insulating ourselves and looking out for ourselves individually. That does not work. It might work for a few years, but then the minute you have a problem, you're right back in that situation. Whether you get pulled over or whatever it is, you have healthcare issues, whatever it is, you're right back in that situation where our collective condition will dictate what happens to you on an individual basis. So we have got to come to understand that. And that will happen when we develop the consciousness to spread that message among our people. But it will never happen when there's only a few of us talking like this. And the majority of people will listen to us, but will never take on their responsibility to help us spread this message. Then it'll never happen. You know, long as we could do whatever, we could have the best message in the world. And you eat, you listen to it, nod your head and get fired up for an hour and then eat fried catfish and, and, and yams and then fall asleep for six hours and then wake up and forget everything and don't tell a single soul that we will never get out of the situation that we're in. We cannot do this by ourselves, you all. We need your help. If we could do this by, if I could do this by myself, why would I be sitting here talking to you? I would have just done it by now. We will never get out of the situation until we are in it collectively. That means everybody has to do something. I'm not saying you have to do everything I'm doing. Most of you can't do what I do, but you can do something. You can do some things I can't do. So everybody has to do something. Everyone has to do something. And when we get to that point, that's when we will start to see these problems we have diminish overnight. And in the process of building up for that change that we want, we have to create the structures we need that can properly educate and inform our communities. We have to build these political education structures that we are always talking to you about. We have to have that. Because if we don't have that, where are we getting? Are, are, I mean, is there anyone out there in 2021 that truly believes these capitalist colleges, universities, K through 12 schools are educating our people with everything we need to know to be free? Who, who out here really believes that? Who believes that any enemy is gonna train their slave to overthrow them? When has that ever happened in history where a system has trained the people it oppressed to overthrow them? I challenge you to show me one example where that's happened in history. That has never happened. Your enemies will never properly educate you. So clearly we have to do that ourselves. We have to set up these processes ourselves. Now we have solved that problem in the All African People's Revolutionary Party, but our problem now is how do we convince the rest of you that that's what you need to do? Not that you need to join our party. You should join our party if you're African. You should join, you should join because we're doing good work, work that needs to be done. But I know most of us don't have the discipline to belong to this party. Everybody right now is not gonna be able to do that. We're gonna have to build up for that. So in the interim, that's why we say, you can start your own. You can start the, I'm sick of a Jammu, I want my own organization, organization. And you can, we'll help you start the, I'm sick of a Jammu, I want my own organization, organization. I wish Shakura would divorce her daddy organization. You will help you start that organization. You can do whatever you want you all, but you have got to do 
something. You have got to do something. That is not a choice that you have. That is not your choice to make, not to do something. Because people that came for you did not make that choice. If they'd have made that choice that you're making, you would be in chains right now. That is a fact. I know that people don't believe that because we believe the lie that they told, well, Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves. Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves because we were resisting and rebelling so much that we created the conditions where slavery was untenable. And so they knew they had no choice but to stop it. That's why they stopped it. And if we would study our history, we would know that. It's out there. CLR James, Pan-African Slave Revolts, read it. Herbert Aptecker, Negro Slave Revolts, read it. Walter Rodney, how Europe underdeveloped Africa, read it. And you will understand that we always resisted the slave masters. That's why slavery is not here. That's why they're attacking Haiti as they are, because Haiti has stood up against the French, U.S. imperialism for hundreds of years, and they will never let them rest because they understand that one day we will wake up and see that. And when we wake up and see that in Haiti, we will understand that that's what we need everywhere around the world. And when we finally wake up and see that, they know that they're finished. And so that's why they want to keep to, well, you're not, you don't have anything to do with those people in Haiti. You're in uh, Los Angeles. So all you got to worry about is avoiding the, the wrong set. Um, don't go where the Mexicans live. That's all you got to worry about. Other than that, you're fine. That's what they want you to believe, you know, and then that's it. And most of us believe that. I ain't going over there. Them bloods and them crypts is over there. I ain't going there. Them Mexicans is over there. I got news for you. There was a time not that long ago that the, 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 the ancestors, them bloods and crypts, was the only safe space you had. Where those indigenous people, the ancestors of those Mexicans you talk about, was the only safe space that you had. So you can't let your enemies determine for you what your agenda is going to be. I mean, that where has that ever worked, you all? It never works. It never works. And the reason why, you know, some people think I'm insane and we're insane because they just don't know how to think for themselves. So when you see someone that thinks for themselves, you think they're insane because you, you, your own life is all these rules that the enemy has given you, that you have to live by, all these rules. Think about your life for a minute. I guarantee you, you'll see it. You have all these things that you can and can't do that the enemy created for you don't even know why it is for most of those things. And when you learn to think like a free person and people get mad when you call them a slave, but everything you're doing is what a slave would do. So when you learn to think like a free person, a person that thinks for themselves and has dignity, you will immediately see the difference. And that's all we're trying to do is get us to that point. That's all we want to see happen. We want all of us to get there, not some of us. You know, if I was just concerned about myself, I wouldn't need to be sitting in this hot weather in this planned country right now where they could come out with their noose right now stopping in the middle of nowhere to do this prayer, I wouldn't need to do that. I could be driving in my nice air-conditioned car, getting back to Sacramento. I wouldn't even probably have to come out of here because I wouldn't have gone to a program like I did yesterday. So I'm not living my life for me. I have what I need for myself. I know that the reason why I have what I need is because of people who sacrifice for me to get it. And they didn't do that so I could just use it for myself. They did it so I could fulfill my historical responsibility. As Franz Fanon said, each generation has a mission. They will either fulfill it or betray it. The question that we have to ask ourselves is which one are you gonna be? Are you gonna fulfill it or are you gonna betray it? That is the fundamental question you all. Um, once we begin to do these things that I'm talking about, we can begin to create the kind of defense community defense construction that I talk about in the book. And once we do that, we can build the type of resources to solve these problems. That is how we do it. And people keep asking, I'm gonna get you a book like they're doing me. If I don't look, I don't care whether you buy it or not. It's not for me. It's so we can get free. So stop telling me, I'm gonna get you a book. I, want you. I don't care. Get it because you wanna use it to help us address these problems. You're not doing anything for me. I don't even use the money I get from it for myself. You know, I drove, drove down here to LA 
to help with this. Pro what do you think that money comes from? That's what I use the money for. So you're not doing anything for me. It's, it's to help this movement grow. You know, I remember when we were going to Ghana several years ago when we were in Portland and we were some of us going to Ghana to do work for the party in Ghana. And people were like, we, we had a fundraiser because we had people from all our sister parties that we talk about coming to Ghana from all over the African continent. And, you know, they don't have the resources to travel like that. So people kept saying, we, I'm going to contribute so you can go to, to, to Africa. And I kept telling them, I, I got my ticket. I bought my ticket out of my pocket. This is so we can build the movement. I would never ask you to give me money so I can do anything. That's why I, that's why I worked so hard as I did to get the skills that I've acquired so that I could provide that for myself and for my family and for this movement. When I ask you to contribute money, it's so that we can build movement beyond individual resources. I've never asked you for a single penny for myself or for Shakura and never will. So that's what we need. And when we do that, that's when we'll have capacity to address these problems, you all. That's when we'll make that happen. All right. So just want to close by saying we have everything we need to address these problems. We have to start by not allowing our enemies to demonize our people. If you decide you wanna get vaccinated, get vaccinated. I did it because I wanna to travel to Zimbabwe soon and that's the only way I could do it. So do that. If you decide you don't wanna get vaccinated, don't do it. But we have got, it cannot just stop there as an individual decision for a people who are collectively oppressed. We have got to start figuring out how we can develop collective approaches to these problems and stop every time something happens. It's the same approach of individualism. It's not working for us, you all. We are dying from this COVID thing because we have no process to protect ourselves. We're totally reliant on our enemies for everything, all our information, all our resources, everything. And that is not a good position to be in when you're us, when you're African people. That is not a good position to be in. We have got to correct that. So the first part of that is we've got to get the right information because power is conceived from a conception. So we have got to get our people talking about these issues in healthy ways. So we ask you to share these resources that we have. Please share them. Please, please, please. Like James Brown, I'm telling you, please share these resources. Please let people know. If you let one person know, that's good. So our ancestors' voices, this program, every Sunday, we're moving towards 90 consecutive weeks, nine zero. Shakur and I are doing this. We're gonna continue until we drop. So please let people know. Next Sunday, August 29th, 2021, we're 4 to 5 p.m. Pacific time. Today is August 22nd. This is the 32nd commemoration of the murder of Huey P. Newton, the founder and ideologue of the Black Panther Party for self-defense. Yesterday, August 21st, was the 50th commemoration of the assassination of George Jackson, Comrade George Jackson, Field Marshal for the Black Panther Party in San Quentin Prison, set up by the prison authorities and murdered because of his work. Do you all know, if you know anything about these prison organizations, you know that the Mexican mafia, La Ime, right? Y'all saw the movie, American Me, Edward James Olmos, you saw that. So if anything, you know that, since most of us, that's what we rely on as movies to study history. So La Ime is real. It's not just the Edward James Olmos movie. Um, and the Mexican mafia is a thing. And they, to this day, control much of what happens in California in these cities in terms of drugs and other things. They still control a lot of that. And because of how it's structured in the prisons, they have an alliance with the Aryan Brotherhood, which is a white supremacist organization. Don't ask me how, that's just how it is. And as a result of that, they did that because they had to go up against the uh, Nuestra La Familia or the Norteños, which is Northern California Mexicans, right? And Nortanyos have an alliance with the Africans for the most part. But going back in the day, 
even despite this history, because if you go to some parts of Southern California where they, they call them Sirenios, or like Southsiders, they don't deal with African people. They, they call us Mathes, right? And they don't deal with us like that. We represent a problem in their eyes. But in spite of that, I'm just telling you that history because the founder of La Ime, Mexican Mafia, Rodolfo Sedano, like you don't know that name because you all you knew is Edward James almost in American media and they used it different. I think it was Santana Mon Montanero, some, some fake name. But the real name of the real founder of the Mexican Mafia, his name was Rodolfo Sedano. Look him up, S-E-D-A-N-A. -A. Rodolfo Sedano and then the European who was a part of the Mexican Mafia was part of the leadership that was played by William Forsythe in the movie his his name real life was Joe Morgan, Joe Pink Lake Morgan. He's they're both deceased. They both passed away. I believe both of them from cancer. But um, my point is that the Mexican mafia, Joe Pink Lake Morgan, Rodolfo Sedana, they had an alliance with George Jackson, even though they didn't deal with African people. That's how much they respected George Jackson. That should be all you need to know about how important. George Jackson's work was and why they killed him. So they did that 50 years ago yesterday, Huey P. Newton, 32 years ago today. And so next week, we're going to talk about how Huey P. Newton's murder was not just a drug deal gone bad, as they went to today, but was a part of the FBI's counterintelligence program to destroy our movement. And then please go to aprp-intl.org, join the All African People's Revolutionary Party. A lot of you have been doing that. We appreciate that. We continue to get the inquiries. So please do that. Go to our site, abetterworld.me. All these videos are housed there. There's articles there. You want to uh, throw shade at us, you can do that. There's a comment section. And donate while you're there. That's a good thing to do. And then I'm also an editor for the Hood Communist Collective. And we have this Thursday, we have bi-monthly Telegram events. Download Telegram. It's a free app on your smartphone. And you can join in and talk and participate in the discussion this Friday, or I'm sorry, Thursday. Uh, I believe it's the 29th. I'm, I'm not sure of the date. But um, this Thursday at 4.30 Pacific time, 7.30 Eastern time, we are going to be um, having another wonderful program. We invite you to please join us and participate. We're going to be talking about what's going on in Afghanistan. So you should join in because, you know, we don't know what's going on in Afghanistan. If it didn't come from MSNBC or CNN or CIA, we don't know anything other than what they told us. So join us this Thursday if you really want to get analysis. And we have all these podcasts, right? The APRP, Pontula podcast, our comrades on the East Coast of the United States. We have the APRP, Revolutionary African Women, Raw, last Saturday or each month. Our comrades, we just left in L.A. They host that one. Forward Ever broadcast on Spotify, our comrades in New Mexico, APRP New Mexico, their weekly newscast Thursdays, 12 noon Mountain Time. Check all of those out, you all. Please continue to get with people and buy my book, A God for Organized Defense Against White Supremacists, Patriarchal and Fascist Violence. I'm working with two different groups right now. Neither one of them African, right? One is indigenous people, another is young European people. They want to get organized. They've gotten the book. We're going to help them do that because we know that the more of us who are organized, the closer we get to freedom. So we want to thank you for joining us today. Thank you for enduring all the background noise. Thank you for allowing us to broadcast the way we have. Thank you for the Ku Klux Klan for giving us an hour to organize against you. Thank you to the neo-Nazis for giving us this hour sitting here in your territory to organize against you. You know better. You know to stay away because you know we're not them kind of Negroes. We're the kind that'll slit your throat. So congratulations to you for recognizing that. Thank you all for listening. We appreciate each and every one of you. One unified socialist Africa is going to happen. Doesn't matter whether you believe it is or not. I'm telling you right now, it is going to happen. And you'll be the first one in line trying to put me out of line to get the benefits of it. And that's okay. So we want to say that white supremacy is whack. It's got to go. Patriarchy is whack. It's got to go. Homophobia is whack. It's got to go. And capitalism, you already know it's got to go. Everybody have a great rest of your Sunday evening. Forward ever. 
backwards than ever. 